All right. Um, so I guess I'll get started. So I'm uh, uh, Badrish uh, Chandramauli. I'm a researcher in the database group here at MSR Redmond. And uh, today I'll be talking about open source uh, technologies for streaming and state management from our group, uh, focusing really on uh, uh, two systems that we have built recently and uh, uh, open source called Trill and Faster. So brief uh, uh, background. Uh, so I work in the MSR uh, database group here in Building 99. On, uh, our group works on uh, a diverse set of research areas, such as uh, uh, streaming, big data analytics, uh, key value stores, uh, storage, security, transactions, scale out, you name it, everything related to uh, uh, basically the database uh, uh, platforms. Uh, recently, uh, we have uh, been open sourcing a lot of the research that we have been doing in our group, and I wanted to focus on uh, some of these projects in this talk. Uh, these are all uh, uh, in, available in GitHub under uh, an MIT license. Uh, the first is the Trill, which is a proven streaming engine that we uh, built here in the database group and is now part of uh, the Cloud Enterprise organization. Uh, it's a streaming engine for real-time and offline analytics, um, which I'll talk about shortly. The next piece is something more recent, which we built over the like, last couple of years, is Faster. It's a fast key value store for resilient state management. And I'll be uh, focusing today on uh, a little bit more details about these two uh, systems. The others uh, that we have also open sourced recently include a CRA, which stands for a common runtime for applications. CRA is a powerful distributed runtime for data flow graphs, and it allows you to build uh, distributed uh, analytics or data flow systems. It's available at this URL. And uh, the, the, uh, the other uh, project we have open sourced recently is uh, Ambrosia, which is uh, a highly robust uh, 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 actor-based framework for highly robust applications and microservices. And today's focus will be really on the streaming and state management. And you can talk to a bunch of us who are here uh, uh, on all of these projects. So it's, this includes folks like Umar, uh, Sebastian, uh, and Guna, and a bunch of us are out here. So feel free to uh, talk to us about these projects. So let's start with uh, a brief description of Trill. So a lot of you may be familiar with Trill from uh, several years back. It was a project that we started by, way back in 2012. Uh, and its goal was to be a streaming engine for both the cloud and the edge. Uh, a lot of scenarios for big data analytics, basically, that we were looking at, at across Microsoft drove this project. This includes uh, uh, very simple uh, real-time uh, uh, monitoring of applications, the uh, exhaust that is generated by all these cloud applications, and having to raise alerts and problems are detected. The other kind of use case was, uh, the, apart from real-time, was the co combination of real-time with historical, where we wanted to be able to take real-time streams and correlate it with, for example, what happened, say, a week back to detect uh, anomalies and things like that. Uh, offline analytics was also very important, where the logs that were being collected in these data centers had to be, uh, either back, uh, had to be used for either backtesting your real-time queries or to do analysis or time series analysis on these offline logs themselves. So there was a need for an engine that could support all of these applications. And we distilled out several key requirements for an engine to, be handle, to handle all of those uh, kinds of scenarios. The first is performance, which is particularly important for uh, both real-time and offline, right? And particularly for offline, because you take a large amount of data and you want to process them in, say, maybe tens of seconds or minutes to be able to give interactive responses to your queries. At the same time, you wanted low latency for uh, real-time. Uh, fabric and language integration was the other requirement, which really meant that we, want, we wanted to build a streaming engine as a library that could be embedded in a variety of distributed fabrics. And this turned out to be a key reason for Trill's uh, success, where uh, uh, it uh, just acts as a library that you can embed, for example, in systems like Orleans or uh, Scope and all of these different kinds of fabrics. Uh, the, as part of the language integration, it's also written in a high-level language, which allows us to support rich data types. And for example, this is super important for uh, when you are uh, performing operations that uh, use a superset of the SQL data type system. And finally, the query model that Trill supports uh, is a superset of SQL. It supports temporal, it supports pattern detection, and all of those kinds of uh, uh, features. So uh, basically, Trill, uh, in terms of performance, it was around uh, two to four orders of magnitude faster than the, the traditional streaming engines at that time. And for relational, we were... Uh, 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 able to get performance that was comparable to the best columnar database systems uh, at the time. And the way we approached that was by uh, this notion of uh, having user control latency specifications. So the user says how much latency they're willing to tolerate. And then we use that to perform micro-batching and columnarization and applying the database techniques within these uh, micro-batches to uh, provide us uh, better performance and thereby uh, straddle this uh, latency throughput uh, trade-off. 
We built really as a high level language uh, a component in C sharp, and it works with arbitrary uh, language uh, data types and libraries. And the query model was uh, fairly rich with support for uh, complex windows, pattern detection, and uh, pretty much what uh, uh, you would need in this kinds of uh, uh, real time and, of, uh, and time series analysis environments. So Trill is uh, used across Microsoft, including in the Azure Stream Analytics uh, service. And we have Todd from ASA here if you want to talk more about that service as well. Uh, and the key enabler for uh, Trill was the combination of performance, the fabric, the language integration, and the library nature, and the query model. So the current status is that we have open sourced it just a couple of months back. And we are actively looking for, for use cases outside Microsoft to be able to both use and contribute to the system. The libraries are also available on NuGet, which is the uh, package management system that is used with Visual Studio. Uh, it works on .NET Core, so you're not really restricted to Windows. We can use it on uh, Linux. It, it works on the edge, works on the cloud, and it's pretty much a very uh, kind of reusable component that might be useful in any form of real-time or offline time-oriented analysis that you may be interested in. We've also been doing work on combining Trill with the, the other systems that I mentioned earlier. For example, Trill with CRA gives you a, a system called Quill, which is a multi-node uh, streaming analytics system. And uh, uh, you can also use Trill with uh, some uh, systems like Ambrosia to build real-time pipelines, and it's faster to externalize your operator state as Trill is a pure in-memory uh, system. Uh, so uh, the next project I want to briefly overview is Faster, which is a relatively newer project which we've been working on. It's an embedded uh, key value store for uh, uh, state management. And uh, the basic problem that Faster addresses is that particularly uh, it kind of uh, grew out of the, our experience with Trill, where Trill was used in these large-scale distributed uh, uh, pipelines with managing huge amounts of state. For example, in Bing, uh, they uh, uh, have billions of users or ads in the system where which, for which you have to uh, maintain some state and uh, update them as new uh, data arrives in the system. Uh, this uh, also includes uh, stateful applications such as IoT device tracking, data center monitoring. All of them are super stateful. So by state, I mean like uh, uh, you have a large number of independent objects. This could be uh, users in the system or advertisements in your pipeline. And uh, you have some amount of state. For example, this could be a machine learning model or some uh, statistics for every single object in the system. Now, the aggregate state is so large that it does not fit in memory. And this is particularly problematic even for edge or multi-tenant uh, use cases where you're indexing a huge amount of state, but uh, and you don't want to be able, uh, you don't want to uh, provision for the entire state and uh, uh, the kind of operations that you perform on the state are very simple typically it includes point operations right i mean you just do a hash lookup uh, look up a particular object and uh, maybe do some operation on it or maybe you perform an update on the object so you uh, read the old cpu reading and maybe increment it or, and things like that and of course the state needs to be recoverable uh, there's a particular property that we can uh, exploit in these kinds of applications is that even though the amount of state is large, uh, for example, in a search engine, you have billions of users who may be alive in your, say, seven-day window of data that you're maintaining. But the number of users who are actively surfing the web or kind of doing actions at a given point may be a small fraction. So this could be, for example, only millions are actively surfing and being update updating their uh, statistics at any given point. So we wanted a, a system that could exploit this, uh, this and... and uh, uh, reduce the amount of memory footprint that would be required to uh, handle the, the, the state in these kinds of applications. <coughs> so FASTER is a result of this, uh, uh, these requirements, and it's a latch-free, concurrent, multi-core uh, hash key value store. It's designed for basically a shared everything uh, uh, environment where you have a bunch of threads talking to a shared memory and uh, having a, a, some kind of backing store in the end. It's designed for high memory, high performance, and scalability across threads. So it's a multi-threaded, latch-free system. It supports data larger than memory. So you can basically uh, tune the, uh, uh, the, the hot working set and exploit the temporal locality so that the hot working set stays in your main memory and the older data kind of uh, spills off to uh, 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 secondary storage or tiered storage. And this could be things like Azure blobs or cloud storage in general. The performance... Uh, uh, is uh, uh, very good when your working set fits in memory. So for example, if, uh, even if the, you're indexing data larger than memory, if your hot working set happens to fit in memory, we show that we can actually uh, outperform pure in-memory data structures like, uh, uh, by, uh, by, by significant numbers. And particularly when uh, you start comparing it with systems that can handle data larger than memory, we are orders of magnitude better than uh, those kinds of systems that are out there today. So for a YCSB workload on a single machine, with say, a high-end machine with two sockets, we're able to, able to get around 150 to 200 million operations per second. The interface of FASTER is uh, 
consists of uh, both point reads and blind updates, as I mentioned, but also uh, uh, atomic read modify write operations, which are particularly uh, interesting in streaming scenarios, where you read a value and you make an update to it. So you, it could be incrementing a counter or uh, updating some uh, field in your uh, in, in your vector of machine learning model parameters. Uh, here's a brief graph of scalability of faster with respect to number of threads. So this shows that we uh, uh, faster uh, on the, on the multi socket CPU gets pretty much linear scalability for the YCSB workload, and interestingly, it's comparable to uh, pure in-memory data structures such as the Intel TPB hash map, which a lot of us are familiar with. And uh, uh, when you compare it to the today's indexes that are used to kind of uh, to uh, uh, handle larger than memory data, it, it, it is significantly better. Very briefly, I'll uh, uh, kind of geek out on the next couple of slides on the system architecture before kind of uh, 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 stepping back and uh, uh, pro providing the, uh, the current status of the project. So uh, it does a bunch of threads talking to a hash index in faster. And it's the index is backed by what we call as a hybrid log, which is a log of all the records that have been uh, that are being accessed. So the hash index basically uh, uh, contains the root of essentially a linked list of all the records that uh, uh, collide uh, to that location in the hash chain. Uh, there are three key technical innovations that we talk about, and the, the work is the, was presented at Segmod last year, and you can look at it for details. Yeah. So uh, the, the innovations there are with respect to indexing the record storage, and the threading model. So I think these were the kinds of uh, um, innovations that uh, allowed us to build a, a system that can handle uh, uh, data. And the important thing here with the record log, very briefly, is that it goes across disk and the main memory. So the hot records will stay in memory while the cold records are pushed out to disk. And a little bit more briefly, uh, uh, more, in more detail, the record log consists of a single address space that uh, spans both external memory and main memory. And what uh, the record log does is that the hot records that are currently being updated go into the mutable region of the log, which sits in the tail. So you can do in-place updates of those records. And as the records become colder and they age out, they enter the read-only region, and you perform what is known as a read-copy update to bring them back. So essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a, a hybrid between the traditional log structured systems and the pure in-memory systems. So I'm going to sp skip over some of the technical details uh, uh, and, and just talk about the current status of the system. It was open source in August, and it's available in both C Sharp and C++. And uh, it is uh, uh, pretty much in, in, a good, uh, in, in good state, and we have a lot of uh, contributors who are also interested in uh, kind of uh, uh, in uh, providing new features. And we are, uh, it's really about, uh, uh, if you want to learn about the, uh, the kind of the research innovations, you should look at our, our, our papers. And one of the interesting things we are doing right now is to integrate Faster and Trill, which are now both open source. So to summarize, we have recently open sourced a bunch of these research projects, and we invite everyone to use, contribute, perform follow-up research, and talk to us for more details. Thank you. OK, I'll suggest Dana to come up. And um, is Dana here? Oh, Jenna, Jenna is here. Um, while while Badrish is taking questions, any questions for Badrish? So this works on a single node. How does it how does it spread? Right. So uh, these are components that uh, so we have, we've approached this in a layered approach. So we first build the single node components. In fact, a single core component that we kind of generate so single, the multi node. But we have the distribution layers that I didn't talk about uh, in this talk. So the, uh, the pieces of CRA and Ambrosia are those that uh, take these single node components as unmodified building blocks and build distributed uh, pipelines out of them. So all of them are open source. Any other questions? Okay, thank you again, Here's our next speaker. We have Jalan Wang from uh, Simon Fraser University, who is going to talk about democratizing data preparation for AI. Okay. So, uh, thanks everyone for coming under this special weather condition. Uh, this is Jianan from Simon Fraser University. Uh, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about three topics. And in the first topic, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, Simon Fraser University Database and Data Mining Group. And the second one, I'm going to talk about my vision to democratize data preparation for uh, AI. In the last part, I'm going to talk about my recent research project called TAR, which is help you to speed up data, data labeling. Okay. So it's the first part, I want to briefly introduce uh, our database and data mining driven group. Uh, we have been working on this area for over 30 years, and we have made uh, a lot of impact on 
both education side and also the industry side. For example, we develop a number of very famous data mining algorithm called dbscan and prefixscan. That is widely used in industry. And we also uh, written a, a textbook called data, uh, data mining that is also widely in uh, many, many universities in North America. And so we are working on a wide range of research topics, and we publish papers extensively in uh, data mining conferences and also database conferences. And I want to particularly mention uh, Tian Zheng Wang, who is sitting uh, on the back. He actually a new faculty member uh, joining our school a few months ago. He's working on cloud database and also how we can develop a, <coughs> a modern database system using new hardware. Okay, all right. So. Now I'm going to talk about my, uh, my vision to democratize AI. So how many of you have heard of this phrase? Okay, so, uh, so if you think about democratizing AI, what does it mean that we want to make AI accessible for everyone? Okay. And you think about the, the current innovation of AI, it's really a combination of computing algorithms and training data. Okay. And for computing, I think, the problem is solved thanks to all the cloud providers. Uh, because right now, I can easily teach an undergrad student to launch hundreds of machines uh, within minutes. Okay. And for algorithm, I think the problem is also kind of solved because although deep learning is very, very hard to use, but because of those software and Many, many undergrad students, they can write just a few lines of code to run very, very complex deep learning algorithm to detect objects in image, okay. But what about training data? And although there's a few projects that focus on the training data, but I would say this part is still the bottleneck. Because about three years ago, I was a postdoc in the AMP lab at UC Berkeley. And at that time, I heard that many data scientists complained that I spent more than 80% of time on data preparation. But nowadays, when I talk with them, they still complain that. Even say, oh, I spend even more than 80% of time on data preparation. I think in order to democratize AI, we really need to turn our focus on democratizing data preparation. And some of, when I present the data, some of will say, oh, it's so hard, the problem is so hard, it's important for you to solve. Because think about that, how much time and how much money we spend to democratize computing, to democratize algorithm, and how much time and money we spend to democratize data preparation. I think if it's really the time that we think hard how to democratize data preparation for AI. I want to be more precise about what I mean by data preparation. So nowadays, many companies, they put all the data in a centralized place. This is called a data lake. And they hire a bunch of data scientists. Hopefully, they can build some models using the data stored in data lake. And the first step is they have to generate the training data. And the process of turning the data in the data lake into the training data, which has a feature, has a label, is called data preparation. And so why this problem is so hard? So I, I remember I had a conversation with Phil, who is sitting here uh, at CIDR about two years ago. And I asked him that, why do you think data cleaning is very, very challenging? I think he, he, he said that, oh, he thinks that data cleaning is not a single problem. It's a collection of many, many challenging problems. Think about that data cleaning is just one step in data preparation, which means that if we really want to solve the data preparation problem, we have to solve all challenging problems that are listed here. So that's why it makes it so hard to solve the data preparation problem. And some may say that, oh, for each problem, we have already tens of papers and many, many tools and many, many algorithms to, <clears throat> to solve that. Then what's new here? And in my opinion, I think there's at least two great opportunities for database community. So one is that in the past, when we develop algorithm, we are focused on how to reduce the machine time. But nowadays, I think we need to turn our focus on how to reduce the data science time. So imagine we develop an algorithm, we need to ask ourselves, if there's no such approach or no such tool, how much time that their scientists spend to do the task? If they have the tool, how much time they spend to do the task? If it can reduce a lot, then it's a good tool. So in order to reduce the data scientist time, we have to make sure our method is easy to use, is extensible, 
and also has a com good composite, uh, composability property. And another great opportunity I think we may have is uh, we can apply advanced machine learning technologies. So I know there's a talk later talk about the automated machine learning. I think why can't we apply automated machine learning to solve some challenging data preparation problem? Because many problem in data preparation is essentially machine learning problem. We don't really need data scientists to rebuild the entire machine learning pipeline to solve those problems. And also the meta learning. So because when, when I talk with uh, uh, several banks uh, in Canada, so basically they all want to do the same thing. So they want to build a churn prediction model, they want to build a fraud detection model, they want to build a financial product recommendation model. Why can't we leverage the, the effort they spend to prepare the data so that if a new bank wants to build, rebuild all the models, they, have to, they, don't have to rebuild, they don't have to rebuild their entire data preparation pipeline. So I, I think these are two great opportunities for the data, uh, data, data community to solve this uh, data preparation uh, challenge. And uh, so in my lab, we have a, a few projects that in order to fulfill this vision. And uh, uh, last year, I, present, I presented two projects. One is a focus on the data enrichment, the other focus on the exploratory data analysis. And today, I'm going to talk about the TARS, which is focused on the data labeling part. So we know that the Data labeling is very, very expensive. It takes time. Think about that, how much time we spend to build an image night. And I think a very promising idea to reduce data labeling costs is to explore the trade-off between quality and the human cost. So imagine that I just randomly label the data. Then I don't have any human cost. But my label are super noisy, it's useless. If I only ask experts to label the data, then my human cost is very, very high, but my labels are of high quality. I believe there are going to be more and more points in between. For example, distant weak supervision is the idea is we can allow people to define some rules so that they can use the rule to automatically label the data. For example, we can say for every tweet, if they have a smiling face inside, then it must be a positive tweet. So that's called the rules. And when we apply the rule to the data, we label the data, but in a noisy way. And another idea, we can use crowdsourcing. They are not as good as experts, but they can actually still provide good, uh, good labels for us. So, so then the question is, uh, in the future, I, I'm pretty sure there are going to be more and more noisy training data. Then the question is, how can we deal with the noisy training data? And so in fact, this problem has been studied in the machine learning community for many, many years. So there's a good survey paper. So basically, at a high level, there's two ideas. So the first idea is we don't do any data cleaning. We just ignore, we just treat all the noise labels as the ground truth labels. Hopefully, that the model we build can tolerate those noise. Because many machine learning models, they are very robust. They can tolerate those noise labels. And another idea is to machine-based cleaning, where we try to build another machine learning model to predict which instance training example could have a noisy labels. And, and so I have been working on data cleaning for many, many years. And I think that the best way to clean the data, we should get human in the loop. So I'm thinking that why can't we have a human in the loop label cleaning so that human can help us to clean the noisy label? But of course, we cannot ask human to clean everything. The question is, how can we make the best use of human to clean the noisy labels? And our, so we call our recent paper TARS, uh, which is named after an intelligent robot in the movie Interstellar, which can always provide insights for comments to humans. And so at a high level, TARS can provide hum data scientists two pieces of advice. So the first advice is, imagine they have a noisy, test the data, and they have a model. And they want to know that if I use this noisy test the data to evaluate the model, and how good my model will be. And TARS can give the data scientists the, uh, the, the estimation of the true accuracy and also the confidence well to quantify the uncertainty. And the second piece of advice that TARS can give data scientists to tell data scientists how to clean the noisy labels so that they can improve the model the most. 
And so due to the time consumer, I cannot uh, talk about how we do that in detail, but we have a paper that is online, then you can understand how it works. So in summary, uh, I think democratizing data preparation for AI is a really exciting topic and we have as a community we have a, a great opportunity to solve this problem and today we talk about the TARS which is a label cleaning advisor to reduce label labeling cost for AI and the last but not the least we also have two posters uh, from, uh, from my students and one is talking about how we can extract highlights from recorded live videos uh, this work is done by uh, Chang Bo. Uh, the other work is uh, kind of related to the keynote, but we actually, because SQL explanation has also been widely studied, and nowadays we have the machine learning explanation. The question is how different these two kinds of machine uh, explanation is. Can we have a unified explanation framework so that their scientists can either explain a SQL query or a machine learning model? So that's the second ongoing work, which is collaborating with Yu Jin Wu, who is an expert in SQL explanation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, any questions? I have a question. So uh, if we ask people to kind of help clean this uh, labeling data, uh, how different or similar is it going to be when we ask people to, for example, help clean, uh, let's say, you know, duplicate data and just understand if something is duplicate or not duplicate? Is that going to be a similar or same problem or different? Oh, it's because the goal is different. If you ask a human to clean the labels, then the goal is you want to train a better model. But if you ask human to remove the duplicate, their goal is to improve the data quality. <coughs> There's no human uh, model involved. But wouldn't the task be the same for the humans at the end? Uh, yeah, so I think this, uh, we can, basically we can design some micro tasks and show it to the humans so that they can label the data efficiently. But the question, which question shown to the user is different. Let me take maybe one more question. Donna, is, are you here? Can you come up and prepare? Oh, you. Yeah. Let me ask one other question. There, there are these other labeling tasks or, or labeling systems like Snorkel. Right, that sort of do like these mini rules, yeah, yeah. or machine teaching is another example of that. Yeah, yeah. How does that work relate to it? Yeah, so uh, Snorkel is what I mentioned, the weak supervision, and they actually don't do anything. Training. They hopefully to train a machine learning model so that they can tolerate the late noisy labels. And we think we are orthogonal because what if you use Snorkel and train a machine learning model, but you are still not satisfied with the machine learning performance? And then the question is, can we bring human inside to clean the noisy labels? so that we can improve your body performance. Awesome. Great. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. so our next speaker is Dana Pomoa from the University of Victoria. Diana. Diana. <laughs> Diana. Oh, no, it's okay. um, from the University of Victoria, and she's going to talk about influence maximization in massive graphs. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Diana Popova. I am a researcher at University of Victoria, Canada. I would like to talk about two of our latest papers. One was published last year in uh, Proceedings of SSDBM, and another one is just submitted to VLDB. 2019, and we didn't get acceptance or rejection yet. Oh gosh, doesn't want to. I don't know why. It... Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I will talk about influence discovery in graphs in general, then about algorithm scalability, and finally I will tell you about our algorithmic solution to influence maximization problem. First of all, influence discovery. What we want? We want a graph which was given to us to mine it and discover the most 
important or influential nodes. For our algorithm, it doesn't matter what exactly phenomena are man-made or natural, this graph models, whatever. What we get is incidence list, which is a long, long list, just text actually. Um, and that's about the node ID and another node ID. It's a list of edges for the graph. And from this long, long list, what can be received, for example, by web crawler that goes from page to page, follows links, and produces something like that without any idea what was actually written on this page and why this link is given, doesn't matter. That's the input. What we want to get is this meaningful graph structure. You can see in the middle, for example, what appears to be the most influential, the cluster actually, of the most influential models, most important to some extent. We don't know what importance is actually is, but that's what we are trying to figure out, to compute from the incidence list. Now, I must tell you that um, our particular concern and our particular interest was to scale up existing method of computing this importance to massive graphs. By massive, I mean with billions of edges. Graph that models, for example, Facebook or Twitter or constituency of, I don't know, United States of America for the next general election. Something like that, really massive. And to figure out how we can do meaningful and theoretically proven, guaranteed solution for the graph structure of that size. That was our thing. Now, scalability, just a few words. Um, there exist tons of algorithms that do it, that do graph mining and can figure out most important nodes, for example, and whatnot. Unfortunately, it's impossible to do in practice because if graph is massive, it will take close to infinite time plus unlimited resources to really do it. So, Data scientists invent more and more and more algorithms every year. The main point of them is scalability. So that, for example, on this laptop, I could figure out from incidence list the structure of huge graph. Um, it's very uh, difficult to do because uh, we don't even know how um, to compare scalability of different teams, develop different algorithms, written in different languages, implementation, and how to do it. Anyway, um, recently, in 2017, a very interesting paper was issued where a team um, tested 11 the most recognizable and the latest at that time, different influence maximization algorithms. And what they did, they produced the whole tree uh, that would help customers to pick up this algorithm or that algorithm, uh, depending on how important for them is either quality or uh, memory footprint, or uh, time, processing time. So, now, specifically, we were working with, uh, from all scalable analytics of massive graph, we were working for influence maximization problem, and I already mentioned it, what is it? Uh, given the graph, to try to understand the most important nodes, the most important the way we interpret it is uh, the nodes that 
connected to the most other nodes. It's, it's very easy in Twitter. Uh, we can kind of approximate or evaluate or we can kind of see, oh, okay, this particular person has one million followers. It must be very influential person. This particular person has 30 million followers and probably it's the more thing. It's true, but it's not exactly true because in general, it's not just your degree, um, direct connections to those things, but how influential are those other nodes, and so on. Um, theoretical works, two of them, they were uh, foundation for our research. One was long ago, and second one, it's very interesting, that's Microsoft research team. In 2014, they got a U.S. patent for this particular algorithm. They suggested a new way of doing graph mining. Influence maximization problem in general can be uh, formulated as find a given number of seed nodes such that information would spread far and wide. Class in T, uh, even for approximation algorithm for randomized algorithm. We do doing randomized. Uh, what is different for our approach? All previous uh, teams working on this problem were focused on cutting the time of processing because time is enormous. Even on randomized algorithms, you have to take so many samples. It takes so much time. And so they were trying to do to cut this time, to cut time complexity. We decided, because we are data scientists, to get it from a slightly different approach, not to the best of our knowledge used by any other team before us. And that is to focus on data structures, data structures for small memory footprint, data structures that would allow us to first of all load graph into main memory using just small part of this main memory and the most important, keeping intermediate result of our sampling into data structure which again takes very little memory. So we did a lot of research and there were several papers. But um, the breakthrough came when we started using for storing intermediate result web graph. Now, web graph, it's uh, a compression framework. It's developed by Italian team from Milano. And not only developed, uh, it's not just how to compress the graph. It's a lot of... Uh, um, Different programs they wrote, and they wrote in Java, which was very close to us because I write in Java 8. Um, it's really easy for me to understand what exactly they did and how exactly they did it. And this particular compression allows to up to 10% um, to get to decrease, to go down to up to 10% up to of graph in compressed form comparatively to the original graph. When we figure out a possibility how to compress on the flight during computation, during the sampling from graphs, how to do it for intermediate results, that was our big breakthrough. Second breakthrough is um, this idea, and that is our um, last year paper. Uh, we call this algorithm no singles, and that is like that. When you do sampling, you do trial, you try to understand how much uh, will information spread uh, from a randomly picked up node. Uh, very often, in real world graph, it will spread nowhere because there is a probability for each edge and it's never one, which 
totally corresponds to real life. It's never one, even from the most uh, tightly connected people like one family, that exactly information will spread to everyone. No, somebody will not accept it, somebody will be busy with something else and so on. So anyway, the idea, and this another breakthrough was, why would we store this particular sampling that can get nowhere. We just picked up node at random. We tried to, you know, spread information. No, 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 um, because we randomly picked up uh, the edge uh, corresponding to the probability, given probability of this edge. Will it go or will it not? And in most cases, it won't go. So, here's a little bit of statistic. How many in our samples, yeah, how many those singles um, things? We found a way keeping theoretically proven guarantee. It was proved by a Microsoft research team. Keeping it, holding it, cut, really cut memory footprint that used by our algorithm. We compared it, well, I was working, uh, I am working with Japanese um, Institute of Informatics, uh, Professor Kawarabayashi. So they have supercomputer with RAM one terabyte, and that what uh, we had to use so that we could compare our algorithm with existing algorithms. And of course, it's at least three, if not five, um, orders of magnitude fewer memory used by us. Now, um, then we a little bit um, expanded this particular breakthrough I was talking about and wrote another paper, which is now in VLDB under review. But we already can do conclusion that choice of data structure proved to be instrumental in raising scalability of graph analytics. And focus on not time, but space complexity allowed us to design and implement algorithms processing large graph on this laptop. The biggest one I processed here with theoretically proven guarantee, it was Arabic, which is 640, uh, uh, millions of uh, edges, which is almost billion size graph. Awesome. Katya, do you want to sit up while we're taking, while we're taking some questions? Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, I, I was just wondering, you were talking about data and trying to figure out like the focal point, the, the, the highest, the highest uh, rated parts, right, to, in order to make a graph of it. Um, I'm just wondering how, did you try to apply that in a, medi in a medicine scenario? Actually, it's very interesting because now um, I'm working on new paper. And that is identifying case centers, clusters, anyway. And I am working with protein to protein interaction <laughs> graph right now. Okay. And yes, we are using those things because um, when Dr. Lee actually was presented, uh, presenting, I was immediately thinking, oh my God, they are trying to understand different factors and how important they are. That's what I'm doing, but I'm doing, of course, purely mathematics, theoretical thing. I don't care what the graph is, but come to think about it, yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. It can be done, and it's very important, because if you can do it on laptop, you can imagine practical implications. Yeah. Awesome. Let, let's let's take it offline because we'll have to stay on time. Yeah, we'll and both absolutely. Long break in the middle and um, any any yeah, be right, right, right. Okay. Any any questions? I am here all day. I am going back to Canada only tomorrow. So great. Thanks again. Sir. Great. Our next talk is by Batya Kimik I'm from the University of Washington, and she's going to talk about integrity constraints revision. Thank you. Uh, this is joint work with uh, uh, Dan Suchu. Um, so I'll start by really uh, informally stating the problem. 
Uh, so we have uh, a relation, and uh, we know about uh, integrity constraints, and uh, in this talk we focus on functional dependencies and multivalue dependencies. So uh, in the current setting, either an integrity constraint holds in the relation or it does not. This is uh, something that is binary. Um, but uh, in real life, the data, we can think about the relation almost uh, meeting the uh, uh, conditions of an integrity constraint. Um, uh, or we can say that the relation satisfies an integrity constraint to some degree. And basically, we are looking at some uh, type of uh, systematic way to relax exact implications. So suppose we have a set of integrity constraints, uh, sigma, and another one, tau. And suppose that we know that uh, this uh, type of implication holds, and I will define what exactly uh, this implication means formally very soon. But suppose that uh, we have some implication that holds. Um, what can we say about the, this implication if the antecedents, or those that are in sigma, hold only to a large extent? Not exactly, but they hold to a large extent. What can we say about the extent with which tau holds in the uh, relation? And, uh, so, and this type of question has a lot of application, in particular when we want to mine, there is a lot of work on mining approximate integrity constraints uh, in a database instance. Um, it is also used for data cleaning and uh, in the uh, probabilistic inference literature it is used for learning the structure of, of uh, probabilistic graphical models. Uh, so in order to formally define uh, the implication problem and uh, to formally define what is relaxation and so on, I will uh, introduce some uh, key concepts and ideas. Um, so uh, the first one is uh, conditional independence in probability distributions. And uh, I will very soon also explain the exact relationship between integrity constraints and uh, conditional independencies in probability distributions. So we have a, a probability distribution over a set of uh, random variables. And we say that A and B are independent given C if their joint probability factorizes as you see here. We say that an independent statement is saturated if it covers all of the variables, in this case all of X, and it is marginal if it is conditioned on the empty set. Um, so now that we know what uh, uh, conditional independences are, we can uh, formally define the conditional independence implication problem. So assume that sigma is a set of conditional independent statements, like those that I showed in the previous slide, and tau is another uh, conditional independent statement. So we say that tau implies sigma, and this is the notation. If for every probability distribution that satisfies the conditional independent statements in sigma, it also has to satisfy a uh, tau the conditional independence tau. Um, and in the uh, uh, late 80s, uh, uh, Judah Pearl uh, uh, came up with uh, this set of uh, axioms that you can see there are simple rules for implying additional conditional independent statements and showed that uh, they are sound and that they are complete for the saturated and marginal conditional independencies. Meaning that uh, if I want that I'm capable using just these, just by activating these axioms, I can basically, we can basically uh, find all of the saturated conditional independencies or marginal independencies that hold in the distribution. Okay, so back to our setting, to the database setting. Let's say a quick uh, review of functional dependencies and multivalue dependencies. So we say that the relation satisfies the functional dependencies A determines B. If for every pair of, of tuples that agree on A, they also agree on B. And embedded multivalue dependencies, like the one shown here, basically holds if a, a if the projection on the set of variables in the independence is exactly a, can be factorized, as you can see here. You see the similarity between uh, uh, probability distributions. It's the same type, some type of factorization. And the multivalue dependency or an MVD is simply an EMVD that covers all of the attributes. And it is known that we can, uh, that the Armstrong's axioms are uh, sound and complete for uh, implying all of the functional dependencies and Berry's algorithm is sound and complete for uh, discovering all of the MVDs. Okay. So now what is exactly this relationship between integrity constraints and conditional independencies? So we can view the uh, relation R as an empirical distribution where each tuple uh, T has a, a probability, a uniform probability of one over N, where N is its uh, the 
cardinality. And basically what we can see is that um, if we have the MVD uh, that given A, B, and C, a uh, the disjoint, this B and C factorized according to what we saw, then this happens, the MVD holds in the relation if and only if B and C are independent given A in this empirical distribution. So this is the relationship. Note that this, this holds only for MVDs. It fails for EMVDs. For example, uh, this EMVD B and C uh, factorized uh, holds in this relation, but it is not the case that B and C are independent in the empirical distribution. This is uh, easy to see. Okay, so uh, as I said, we want to be able to uh, look at so what we call soft constraints. Um, so how exactly can we quantify the extent with which an integrity constraint holds in the relation? And we use for this information theory. Here are the uh, formulas, they are not particularly important. It's just uh, um, the most important thing maybe to know this is uh, the mutual information uh, here and to know that all of these um, terms are always uh, positive for every uh, probability distribution. Um, so for conditional independencies, X and Y are independent given Z if and only if the mutual information, the appropriate mutual information is zero. And basically we will use this mutual information to quantify the degree of independence between X and Y given Z. And it has been shown already in the 80s by uh, Lee that a functional dependency holds in the relation if and only if the, uh, the conditional entropy in the empirical distribution is zero, and then MVD holds in the relation if and only if the uh, appropriate mutual information is zero uh, in the empirical distribution. And it is worth noting that both, that in general, these implication problems, both, both for uh, databases and for uh, uh, finding conditional independencies, there are uh, impossibility results. Okay, so now to the main result. Uh, so the re our relaxation problem is as follows. We have a set of conditional independencies and we assume that we know that sigma implies tau using one of the known uh, uh, axiomatic systems and we want to be able to bound tau in terms of uh, sigma. And we look at two types of bounds. The first we call relaxation where we want to uh, bound tau using a, linear com a positive linear combination of the items in sigma. This we call relaxation, and we want to see uh, cases in which we can find a tighter bound where basically all of these coefficients are one. So the first result is that functional dependencies admit unit relaxation. Basically, it means that if a set of a, a functional dependencies imply an, another functional dependency, then this also holds in the soft sense. We can really have a good bound on this implied functional dependency, the extent with which it holds in the database. And here you can see an example. These three uh, functional dependencies imply that A, B, D determine F. And therefore, what you see below uh, is a valid information theoretic inequality that will hold in every relation. However, in the general sense, conditional independencies do not admit relaxation at all. Um, so in a paper by Kassad and Romashenko, they showed uh, that uh, this uh, implication, so this implication always holds, but for any uh, set of uh, co positive coefficients, we can always find the distribution such that the mutual information between C and D is unbounded as a function of this. So we can see that we cannot hope to have that this relaxation always hold, but in some sense it holds in the limit because for every given, for every epsilon, we can find some set of coefficients that uh, can bound it. So uh, we have some uh, trade-off here in that sense. So this was a, a relatively negative result. Um, another one that uh, is positive is uh, for saturated conditional independencies, which are those that actually correspond to uh, multivalue dependencies. Um, so looking at the conditional independencies, we say that X and Y are independent. It's, we say that two pairs of conditional independencies are disjoint if uh, at least uh, uh, one of the following conditions hold, meaning either uh, X and C, the, their intersection is non-empty, or Y and C are non-empty, or uh, symmetrically the other way around. 
And we show, and it is worth noting that all of uh, Pell's axiom, those semi-graphoid axioms are basically disjoint. You always use two disjoint conditional independencies in order to imply another one. So it is not, uh, so, so, so actually this condition can be found to hold uh, in practice. And basically we show that if sigma is a set of disjoint conditional independencies and tau is saturated or corresponds to an MVD, then uh, the implication admits unit relaxation. So in that case, we can find really a very uh, tight uh, bound. Um, here is an example. So this is a very simple example uh, that uh, these two conditional independencies imply the one, that one in the end. And you can see that uh, uh, the uh, disjoint condition holds because um, Y appears here is one of the uh, uh, sets that uh, are in the conditional independence. And uh, indeed, this can be relaxed to uh, this inequality. So we are capable of bounding the extent with which that MVD can hold in the relation using the two used to imply it. Um, so to conclude, uh, there is a, we, so the, the connection between uh, integrity constraints and information theory has been known for a long time. Um, uh, but looking at uh, this relaxation problem uh, is, a, is a new problem, really trying to find out uh, the extent with which uh, an integrity constraints holds in the relation. And uh, there are really practical uh, directions to this because uh, usually data rarely satisfies constraints really in a precise manner, but only approximately. Um, and so, and the main problem, problems here are really finding good bounds of those coefficients for many cases. So we showed some cases where the bounds are one. Um, we can show that the bounds, uh, we showed that in general the bounds can, th there are no bounds, the coefficients can be unbounded. Um, for a different, we can look at different sets of, different uh, sets of these conditional independencies and also there uh, the bounds are not necessarily one. So this is really, um, a big open problem in this uh, area. Any questions? Okay, so I'm wondering if uh, this bound has anything to do with the uh, number of distinct value of the column. Like if we know uh, the column has a small number of distinct value, will that help you to prove something about the column? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe if it has a, a small number of values, then uh, we can use uh, uh, more exhaustive techniques to, to check. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, actually finding a theoretical uh, bound for the coefficient, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's a good, uh, it's a good question. So many years ago when I worked in this general area, the rude question that I never knew how to answer was what to do about the fact that these dependencies almost hold but not quite. And I'm really delighted to see a line of work that's trying to get to the bottom of that. Your last slide says that um, this is of potential practical importance. I agree that these constraints that are almost satisfied are certainly important, but what do I do with this insight you know, now that you've got this axiomatized and you can solve certain inference problems? How can I use that? For example, if you want to decompose a relation and you say, okay, and I know I cannot decompose it, I will lose some of the tuples in the joint, but uh, given that uh, you know that uh, certain cont integrity constraints almost holds, then you can say, okay, I'm going to decompose it. I know I will lose some data but it will not be too much. I can quantify the amount with which uh, it will lose. Same goes for learning uh, probabilistic graphical models. You can assume the independence. You say, I know, I know it's wrong. I know I can, they are not completely independent, but I can still treat them as such. I'm willing to uh, have that error. Got it. So you get an approximation, get an approximation to, a, um, to the answer. Yes. Great. Awesome. Thanks again. Our next speaker is Gang Lu from uh, the University of Washington, and he's going to talk um, 
about machine learning with big clinical data, automating machine learning with clinical data. Okay, can you hear me? Um, so, like most of you, I'm also a database PhD, but I'm hiding in the medical school. So. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, how to use uh, database techniques to support machine learning from a medical point of view. But the te techniques I present are all general stuff, so you can also apply them to non-medical data. We all have lots of medical data, and uh, everybody in medical school is talking about how can we do uh, pretty modeling to build pretty models to predict patient outcome to guide interventions. So as computer scientists, we say, oh, machine learning is natural choice. So in the medical school, if you come here, you will see that uh, machine learning is very rarely used and almost never deployed in clinical practice. And there are several reasons behind that. I'm going to talk about two of the reasons in this talk. So the first one is that uh, as computer scientists, we have strong computing expertise. So we know that in order to use machine learning well, we have many machine learning algorithms we can choose. And we pick one machine learning algorithm and this machine learning algorithm has many hyperparameter values, like uh, the number of decision trees in a random forest. So we set those values somewhat arbitrarily, and we use this combination of machine learning algorithm and hyperparameter values to build a model. At the very beginning, the model accuracy is typically low. So we have computing expertise. We change the machine learning algorithm, or we change the hyperparameter values. Then we rebuild the model. We often do it hundreds or two thousands of times. We get our model, the accuracy is good enough. But this is very hard for healthcare researchers to do because they don't have computing expertise. And second, even if we can build such a model with high accuracy, as Swin just talked at the beginning, uh, most machine learning models are black box. They just don't explain, say, oh, I'll give you a prediction, say this patient will have bad outcome next year, but uh, why this patient will be ha having bad outcome next year, we just don't give um, any explanation. And this is critical for clinical practice. So ne now let me uh, go over those two challenges in a little bit more detail. So the first one is really about model selection. And to resolve this problem, uh, computer scientists have started to work on automatic methods to do model selection in the past few years. So the goal is to help people with little computing expertise to do machine learning. Uh, Google even released a tool called Google Versa two years ago to help with this process. So it's a commercial product. But the existing methods, they cannot handle large data sets. If you take a small data set, such as, say, 10,000 patients, each patient has 130 attributes, you do the search. The automatic model search can already take several days. And if you have millions of patients, each patient has thousands of attributes, that's also common in medical practice, then the search time is daunting. The Google paper showed two years ago that on the scale of Google data sets, it takes half a year to automatic do model selection for deep learning for half a year on a super large computer cluster. And in the medical school, unfortunately, we don't have so many computers, so the situation is even worse. So in order for machine learning to be widely used in the medical school, we need automatic methods, completely automatic, because the users don't have medical, uh, computing expertise, and we also want to do it efficiently on large data sets. And second, uh, even if you can use a tool to build a highly accurate model, that's still insufficient, because if you don't give explanations, say why a patient will have, uh, have a bad outcome next year, the clinicians will not trust your results, they would refuse to use it. And they need to know the reason in order to design tailored interventions. And if they get sued, which is also fairly common in practice, then they have to defend their decisions in court. And for biomedical research, this can help you formulate new theories or hypotheses. So most models are complex. You have decision tree with a few layers. That's easy to understand, but low accuracy. You can do deep learning or support vector machine or random forest, which is complex, can give you high accuracy. But if you just use a single model, you cannot achieve goals, both goals simultaneously, which is typically the case. But in the medical school, we want to achieve both goals concurrently. We don't want to sacrifice even 1% of accuracy because that's patient's life. At the same time, uh, we also want to explain the model's prediction results you know, for a particular patient so that it can be used in clinical practice. So now I'm going to talk about our work to address those two problems. 
The first one is about uh, model selection. So this is the way current model selection method works. It's called Bayesian optimization. So you can choose many combinations of machine learning algorithm and hyperparameter values. You build a regression model, another prediction model, to predict the performance of a particular combination. So you try multiple combinations. Using each combination to build a model, get an accuracy, you build a regression model. Then you use this regression model to find the next promising combination you want to try. You use this combination, the entire data set, to build a model, get an accuracy, update your regression model. Then you iterate this process, typically thousands of times. Then you get the final one you want. So this is the state of the art, but it doesn't work very well. The problem is that if you have a large data set, uh, it takes a long time for you to do model, uh, model building on this data set even once for a single combination. So in the extreme case, let's say you have 10,000 patients. Each one has 133 attributes. You build an ensemble model. This ensemble model actually won uh, one of the uh, uh, major data, open, open data science competitions. On a modern server, it takes you two days just to build a model once. And uh, in reality, you have many more patients, many more f uh, features. And uh, you have a lot of machine learning algorithm, a lot of almost infinite number of hyperparameter value combinations. You want to do the search. That's very slow. So how to address this problem? Um, if you just do it in a machine learning way, deriving formulas, that's almost hopeless. But we are database people, so we can do sampling. So that's the idea. You can have multiple sample sets. You start from a small training set, like uh, hundreds or thousands of data instances. That's doable. Then you start to uh, build models on this small data set. Then you keep expanding the training set, make it bigger and bigger. So at the very beginning, you have a very small training set. You can afford to do many thousands of uh, tests in a very cheap way, very fast. And most combinations will just turn out to be completely un unpromising. You just throw them away. The other ones, you are not really sure, because you are using a small sample to test it. You're not sure whether the accuracy you get is the accuracy that should indicate the combination's performance. So what you can do, you narrow down your search space, and you try to expand your training sample. This is called progressive sampling, shown in the previous slide. You can test the remaining combinations in a smaller search space. And you can have a further higher confidence on their capability. And a lot of them will still turn out to be unnecessary, uh, unpromising, throw them away. And you keep doing it again and again. So over rounds, the training sample become bigger and bigger, and the search space becomes smaller and smaller. And eventually, once you narrow down to, say, two or three combinations, that's not bad. You can even afford to use the entire data set or a large sample of the entire data set to test which one is the one we really want. So this is the idea. Uh, we try them on small to moderate uh, size data sets, not at the Google scale. Uh, we show that uh, our method can speed up the process by 28 times. And also, within a short amount of time, we can search many more configurations. So we will have better luck in finding a better combination. This will also improve the model's prediction accuracy. It actually cut the prediction error by 11 times, 11%. So we are faster. We also um, more accurate. If you go to the data set of Google scale, the search speed improvement will be even bigger because we start from a fixed size uh, sample, which is independent of the size of the entire data set. So the larger the data set size, uh, the bigger performance advantage we will have. Now let's say, oh, the healthcare researchers use our automatic tool to find a good model with high accuracy, but that's not the end of it. Um, you still want to explain the model's prediction results. And also, as Suyin said, we also want to use interventions. If it's not actionable, it's totally useless. So how to achieve both goals, giving explanations and suggest interventions automatically? So this is what we do. Um, we already showed you that uh, we want to achieve both high model accuracy, and we want to explain the model's prediction not for every individual patient. If you use a single model, it's very hard to do. So the trick we play here is that we use two models concurrently. The first model is the most accurate model you want. You don't sacrifice even 1% of its accuracy. So when a new patient comes in this model, 
make a prediction with high accuracy, don't touch it. Then you have a second model, which is association rule based. Everybody here knows how association rule works. Those association rules are mined from historical patient data sets, and it's like a market basket analysis. So the second model is not trying to uh, explain, uh, it's not trying to uh, make predictions. Because for this new patient, some model, uh, rules will say the patient will be at a good outcome, other rules will say the patient will be at a bad outcome. So if you want to resolve the discrepancy, it's hard. So if you use a second model to make a prediction, you will get low accuracy. But the first model already tell you, with high confidence, this patient will have a bad outcome next year. So you can throw away those rules that apply to this patient, but say this patient will be a good outcome. Throw them away. Only the other rules that apply to this patient, saying that this patient will be at a bad outcome next year, only those rules matters. And each rule give you a reason, say why this patient will uh, be at a bad outcome. And those rules are all known beforehand. So what you can do is that uh, once you mine those rules from the historical data set, you can ask a clinician to examine those rules, and those rules will give you hints what kind of interventions can be applied to those patients. So those interventions can be pre-compiled beforehand. When a new patient comes in, you give explanation. At the same time, you suggest interventions automatically. So we achieve both goals concurrently. We cannot do this for every patient because some patients will have bad outcome for rare reasons. But we show that our uh, data set with 10,000 patients predicting who will develop type 2 diabetes next year, we can do this for a highly accurate model. For 87% of patients who were correctly predicted by the highly accurate model to have type 2 diabetes next year, we can give explanations, say why this patient will be at a bad outcome next year. So this is one of the randomly chosen rules just to give you an idea how it works. The rule says uh, the patient is using drug, and this drug is used to treat hypertension and congested heart failure. Both diseases are known to correlate with type 2 diabetes. And the second condition is that a patient's maximum body mass index is at least 35. If you have medical background, you know that this means the patient is obese. And obesity is also known to correlate with type 2 diabetes. So because of those two reasons, we say that's why the patient will likely to have type 2 diabetes next year. And here, you already have an intervention pre-compiled for this rule. This intervention say because the patient is obese, you, so you should put the patient into a weight loss program. And in medicine, it's known that if you can reduce patient's weight, you can reduce the patient's likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes next year. That's known. So it's an effective intervention. So we can give you explanation. We can also suggest the interventions auto, uh, uh, automatically. Thank you very much. Yes. So you have some rules to explain your prediction. Uh, how do you know your explanation is correct? What's the ground to your explanation? So actually, uh, you are not trying to say those explanations are correct because every patient is different. But you just say those are the possible reasons why this patient will have a bad outcome. So eventually, when you do medical practice, each patient has lots of variables. They are scattered on hundreds of pages of historical medical notes. If you ask the doctor to check all those hundreds of pages to figure out exactly what are the reasons, for example, especially you want to do the counting, say how many emergency room visits the patient come in in the last three months, that's very hard. You only have 15 minutes to do that in clinical practice. But the two can do all those analysis beforehand and present you the candidates. Those are the candidate reasons. And then the doctor can check in one or two minutes, say, are those the real reasons? And uh, are the suggested interventions, although they are pre-compiled based on medical knowledge, do they really apply to this patient? And you have to consider the patient's uh, personal situation, which you cannot tell from medical record. You can only know it from talking with the patient. Most likely reason for that, right? Uh, also common reasons, not the real reasons. That's what you cannot deal with Thank you. Yes. Uh, so for the first part, uh, the model selection work uh, using progressive sampling. So uh, I think there is one piece of work in this year's AI, which exactly use 
progressive sampling for model selection with the logical guarantees. So are you aware of what works? No, and uh, we want to claim that uh, we did both work, both work like three years ago. We published it earlier. Okay. Yeah. Yes. One last question. Um, for your, your results on the uh, on the explanation part, you said you were able to predict 87%. Is the reason for not predicting 100% that the, the results of the models differed? Uh, no, it's because uh, I think the reason is that for 13% of patients, uh, they are going to have bad outcome for rare reasons, and those rare reasons are not discovered through association rules. Association rule has support, right? So it only covers the common ones. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again. Okay. It's my pleasure to share my uh, to share our work generating application specific in memory database. So this title is a little bit broad, but actually we are focusing on one type of application: is database application with object oriented program interface. Uh, because many like database applications are developed using object-oriented um, interface like Java, Python, or Ruby. So instead of embedding SQL queries in the program, people usually use uh, object-oriented APIs to each, uh, to and uh, use the OR object relational mapping framework to translate object queries into SQL queries and also convert the relational data back into objects. Um, example of such applications are web applications, which usually use frameworks like Hibernate, Django, and or Ruby on Rails. So we profiled um, 12 uh, open source, very popular applications built with Ruby on Rails, and we are surprisingly find that they are pretty slow. So with a small amount of data, usually less than one gigabytes, uh, in average, um, over three pages take more than two seconds to load. And most of the slow pages spend over 80% on just querying the data. So why are these like, queries really slow, even with a small amount of data? Um, there are three major reasons. The data, nested data model and the predicate involving associated objects and also program-generated predicate. But before I go into the detail of these uh, causes, I'll first give an overview of uh, Chestnut. So, uh, so this is the name of our tool. Um, it generates application specific in memory database. Its role just is just like any um, physical designers. So it takes um, it takes in a query workload and a memory budget. So it customizes the data layout such that the uh, overall query time is minimized. But um, unlike other um, physical designers for relational database, this is specific for database app using object-oriented program interface. And it solves the issues, um, as we will introduce here. Basically, it uses a different storage model and uses a different way to generate query plans. Um, next, I'll go into the three causes of the slow query. The first is the data model. Basically, the problem here is the mismatch between how the application accesses the data and how the data is stored. And this results in a very slow data conversion. Let's take an example here. Assume we have a chatting application, and um, just like Slack, so you have channels and activities in the channel and the users. Um, so, um, so the Application manage this data using three classes, the channel class, activity, and the user class. Assume we have a query that shows the top channels, um, that, and for each channel, it includes activities in the channel, and it, for each activity, it includes the user uh, for creating that activity. So here, the object query looks like this. It starts with um, the top class channel, and it includes activities in each channel, and for each activity, it includes the user. So, and then do order and limit. So in order to answer this query, um, three relational queries are generated. So basically, it's a three selection from the three tables, the channel table, activity table, and the user table. And the result is the three um, and the result is three relations. But the object query requires the result of objects. So there's a process to translate this relational data into objects. So uh, to do so, the first step is to converge the, each tuple into object. And then it inserts each user into each activity. And after that, it's to group the activities by their channel ID, and then insert the activities into each channel's as nested array of objects. 
So even though the relational query is re finishes really quickly within 1.7 seconds, this data, data conversion from relational data to object data is quite expensive, taking all, uh, up to 55 seconds. So the bottleneck is lies in the data conversion. So to solve this problem, Chestnut considers storing data um, non-relationally. It will consider uh, it will consider a storage layer, a storage model that stores the data um, um, that stores the data uh, as a form of object and a nested object, just like this. Um, because the number of activities in each channel is different, so this uh, storage model is not relational. And with this storage model, the uh, data conversion is only from C++ object to uh, top-level Ruby object. Um, this is because like the database is implemented in C++. And uh, this data conversion doesn't change the structure of object, and it only takes uh, um, 1.5 seconds to finish. So using this storage model can accelerate the query by 15x. So the second um, cause of slow query is the query predicate involve associated objects. So before, uh, uh, so I, I'll first show a query that doesn't involve associated objects. So this is a very simple query that um, all, that selects um, active channels and order by ID. So for this query, we can create a partial index that index only on active channels with the key of ID. So um, this is um, the, just like a normal partial index supported by relational database. But what if we change the query to be, we want to select the channels that contains a uh, message activity and also order by ID. Can we still create a partial index uh, just like we did for the first query? Um, with the relational database, the answer is no, because most relational database supports partial, pre uh, partial index that the predicate and the key can only involve the fields that is in, that in the table being indexed. So, but here, the activities is not part of the channel, so this partial index is not possible. But Chestnut, Chestnut will consider such index. So, Basically, uh, Chestnut uh, extends the, in, uh, the index syntax by allowing associated objects, the field, to appear in the keys and the predicate. For example, it, uh, it can create index on channel ID that contain message activity, or it can also create an index on channels with the key being the activity ID. The third problem for slow query is the program generated query predicate. Um, because um, in this object oriented database applications, usually the partial predicate are defined in multiple functions. And the, at, at runtime, the function calls are chained to produce the final, uh, final query predicate. So in this case, query predicates are uh, usually contain overlapping and redundant predica uh, predicates. And the, in this case, the relational um, or query optimizer have a hard time finding the optimized query plan. So let's see an example. For example, we have a page, web page showing join or leave activities, uh, which are also non-message activities that created or updated recently. So the query is like this. Um, we have the predicate says like type is not message, and the type is join or leave, and the created or updated uh, larger than a certain time. So assume we have two indexes available. The first index is a, is a composite index created on field type and created, and the second index is also a composite index on type and updated. So um, we give this um, qu uh, query to Postgres, and uh, can, can you guess whether like, it will find a plan to use this to index or not? Because it seemingly it can use that index to answer this query. So the answer is actually no. If you give this query to uh, Postgres, it will actually generate a sequential scan plan which takes 2.6 uh, seconds to finish. But actually we can notice that um, here the type not equals to message, it's actually a redundant predicate. So um, what if we, we rewrite um, it into an equivalent query that removes the redundant predicate? And this time, 
Postgres can generate a plan that indeed uses two index, and, uh, gen uh, and uh, this plan that using the index takes only 0.5 seconds to finish. So this means that the first query can actually leverage the index, but uh, the existing query optimizer is not able to do that because of the redundant predicate. So uh, this is because most, most of the time, the query optimizer used the rules to, um, to see, like, uh, so to uh, rewrite the query predicate and determine what index to use and how to use it. But instead, um, mm. Chestnut used a different approach. It enumerates plans from a small size plan to large size plan. So the plans, uh, so small size plan, just like the first one, is uh, just an index scan, and uh, it, it will enumerate many different plans with different parameters passed to this scan. From uh, it will also enumerate from small size to larger size. For example, uh, on the bottom, it has a this plan has a four index scan, and then union the result. So it will enumerate many plans, and apparently in this step. Many plans are actually invalid. It cannot answer the query. So Chestnut used a verifi program verification to verify whether um, the, a plan is valid or not. Basically, it used symbolic execution. So symbolic execution is a process where you create symbolic tables. The tables have symbolic values instead of concrete value. So when you run the query on the symbolic table, you get an expression. And when you run the query plan, you get another expression. So it uses a solver to check whether these two expressions are equivalent or not on all possible values of symbolic tables. If yes, then the plan is valid. So basically, it is able to tell that um, the first plan using only one index scan, index scan cannot answer the query. It's, not a, it's an incorrect plan, but the second is. Of course, we can see that this enumeration process is slower than existing query optimizers, but it is able to find out a good plan, for example, the plan that used the index, even for the queries that contain the redundant predicate. But, oh, but this, um, I, this is slower than existing query optimizers, but it is tolerable as long as this optimizer runs offline, and the chestnut is an offline um, um, physical designer. Um, so here, this figure shows the workflow of Chestnut. It takes in the query workload and the memory budget. So first, it enumerates plans and storage models and the plans for each query. And then it uses some heuristic to prune, uh, to prune the plans. And after that, it formulates the problem of the physical design into an integer linear programming problem. Basically, the constraints are first, each query plan uses some data structures. And the second, the use of data structures is, is within the memory budget. And the goal is to minimize the overall query time. So it uses an external solver to solve this IOP problem, and the result tells um, which storage model it uses and uh, the, what, what's plan that every query uses. So based on, based on the result, it generates C++ code, um, and this code implements an in-memory database engine that is designed specifically for this workload. So now I show the evaluation. We evaluated on three open source web applications, and we compare against the three in-memory database engines, including the original application setting, which uses MySQL and uh, Postgres, but we use an automatic indexer, indexer to fill in the missing index that may not have been created by the original, pro, uh, original application. And we also use, uh, used Hyper with automatic indexer as a baseline. So uh, this shows like the average query time of these three applications. Um, the, so we show the relative time to the original. So it, it means that the shorter, slow, uh, shorter bars are better. So we can see here the plan that generated by Chestnut um, has much shorter query time than the other than the other databases. And the number here on the top shows the speed up against the hyper, which gives the best performance among all the relational databases. And note that here, the shaded area shows the portion of data conversion, means converting from, rela from relational data into objects. And this portion actually takes, um, takes, a big, um, takes a large amount of the query time. And uh, Chestnut, you, because it's used a different storage model, it can significantly accelerate this part. And for all of these three applications, it's, uh, in, it, it, in Chestnut is able to find or uh, to generate a database within one hour. 
to conclude, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we introduce a tool, Chestnut, that generates in-memory apps application-specific database, which takes in a, mem a workload and a memory budget and optimizing the overall, um, and, and customize the data layout to optimize the overall query performance. It uses a non-relational storage model, which stores data as objects and nested objects. And it extends the syn uh, in index syntax and uses a synthesis-based a synthesis plan enumeration to be able to find good plans, even if redundant or overlapping query predicates are involved. And we show that it achieves significant speed up in real-world um, web applications. Um, thanks. Any questions? Uh, Way back. How do you handle the evolution of the workload? Uh, what, um, so currently, it's a static process because we take um, the application, assume we can get the source code of the application. So we analyze the uh, source code and then collect all the queries. So we do not handle like dynamically changing workloads. So it's an offline static analysis. But even then, like let's say your application is also evolving, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have to like rerun the because it's an in-memory data in-memory database. So you can, if the application involved, then you can rerun the tool and then generate a new database. Because um, the new database <laughs> will load the data from. Uh, it also have use um, relational database as a back end, but that only is just persist in the data without answering the query. So you can rebuild a in-memory database by loading the data from the backend storage and then, um, and then serve as a new database. Oh. Yeah. Oh, hi. So, so it can, um, if we do have like a Postgres database <coughs> or something else, can we actually, can, can we, can just not translate it into its own database right now? Um, it can, but um, that's Do you like the, the question. Maybe? Oh, sorry. The question. Um, I'm not sure that I understand it correctly. But your question is like, um, if you have already have a, like a Postgres database, can Chestnut translate the query into the SQL query and then issue to the Postgres? Uh, well, okay. So Chestnut, Chestnut is a is a is a query system, or is it the database itself? It's a database. So it handles all the query from the application, but only holds the data in memory. So it still needs a backend storage to to persist all the data to make sure your data is not lost. But it kind of like serves as the middle middle tier that uh, the query, it answers all the query much faster. So the if you have like a read query, you don't need to go through the backend database. So it hold, it's just like a way to hold the data in memory, but store it in a different form, in a different format, such that the data can answer the query more efficiently. I understand. I'm just wondering that if we do have a database right now in Postgres, and we want to translate it into a way where we could query so much faster using Chestnut, will it be able to translate that or um, make its own database? or? So currently, we are not translating uh, the query to the backend database. So we assume that we uh, the workload has all the queries, and then like we can answer all the queries using the in-memory database. Yeah, Be um, because if you have like an unseen query that is not part of the workload, and then it will go to the backend database. Um, and last question. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I have two. Actually, uh, maybe one on the slides fifteen. Uh, you talk about the index. Uh, slides fifteen. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Just one this query, and the first one is that the Postgres doesn't use the index. Do you know why? I don't believe you have the source code of the Postgres. Um, yeah, so I guess I try to. <laughs> So this is like a hard question. I tried to read the Postgres source code, but it's too complicated for me to understand. So I tried different ways, and it turns out that it's the cardinality estimation that has a problem. So um, it, will, it, it will search for like the user plan to uh, use, it will like in, um, find a plan that uses the index. But because of this redundant predicate, it greatly affects the cardinal the cost estimation. And it determines that with the index, the cost is very large. So it determines user sequential scan. Uh, so but I don't know exactly how it uh, do the estimation. So I'm yeah, because I believe this um, 
for database I know, they can use index for this kind of query. Hmm? I mean, a lot of, not a lot, I mean, at least for Teradata, I know that you can use index for this query for the, um, uh, this one. Um, Maybe we can discuss it offline, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So I think all the speakers will be available now during lunch. We'll have now a poster session during lunch as well. Phil has a bunch of logistics yeah, announcements not on lunch. lunch. Not much, really. The lunch is, the lunch is out back. Um, we're supposed to be back. If we want to stay on schedule and get out early, then we should be back um, at 1.15. Um, and the, um, in addition to all the drinks out there, there's also, if you go through these doors and to the end, there's there's a refrigerator full of soft drinks and um, other things to, to drink. If, if you're talking in the second session in the afternoon, please yeah. come up here and sign the re video release form already. Okay, yeah, so and, check that, and check that your laptop works. <laughs> 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 hey, Luis, thanks for coming. I, I...